This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Susie Guerin. Brought to you by TheStreet.com. Interactive financial multimedia tools for an ever-changing financial world. Our dividend stock advisor guides and helps generate income during a period of low interest rates. Real money helps you think through ideas for investing and trading stocks. Action Alerts Plus is a charitable trust portfolio that provides trade-by-trade strategies. Online, mobile, social media. We are the street.com. JC Penny CEO out. A big shakeup happening late today at the struggling retailer. Alcoa kicks off earnings season with better than expected results. We talk with the company's CEO about the numbers and the outlook. Building your nest egg. Some new strategies to protect your retirement savings from those coming tax changes. We have all that and more coming up on Nightly Business Report. And good evening and welcome to our public television viewers. A big management shakeup late in the day today at JC. Yeah, right after the market closed, uh, Tyler, the CEO Ron Johnson is out after just a year and a half in the job. Now, Mike Ullman, a former JCPenney CEO, has been named interim CEO. Johnson, a former Apple executive, has been under pressure for failing to turn around the fortunes of the struggling retailer. JCPenney sales dropped 25% in Johnson's first year at the helm. And then during his tenure, the stock tumbled. 50 percent. In after hours trading, the stock surged as much as 11 and a half percent on word of Johnson's ouster. Joining us now with more on what happened and what's next for the company are Courtney Reagan, who follows that company very closely. Courtney. Hi, good evening to you both, Tyler and Susie. I'm actually standing out here outside the New York courthouse because earlier today the trial resumed between Macy's, Martha Stewart, and J.C. Penney over dispute over product. Ron Johnson has been in battle for quite some time because his turnaround plan, frankly, just hasn't taken hold as he had hoped. Susie ran through some of the stats. They haven't been good. Sales down precipitously, and now it appears that Johnson is stepping down. That is the wording that was used in the press release, an interim CEO will be Mike Ullman. He was the CEO before Ron Johnson. Now, during the time that he was CEO, the stock price fell 17 percent and earnings were relatively flat. As far as where the company goes from here, a lot of questions still unanswered at this hour as to what this interim CEO will change, if anything, as they make the transition and search for a permanent replacement to JCPenney CEO Ron Johnson. Tyler and Susie. So there's no likelihood that Mr. Ullman will be the permanent successor to Ron Johnson whatsoever. At this point, we don't know. It is possible. However, we know that the board moved him out and moved Johnson in. So it's possible he could stay. But as of this point, JCPenney is using the words interim CEO. It has happened in the past in companies that these interims become permanent. But as it was the case with Best Buy, the interim CEO did not actually become the new CEO. And that was just recently. You know, Courtney, I think the million dollar question here is, is JCPenney fixable no matter who's the CEO? What's your sense on that? You know, Susie, I think that it is fixable. I think the big question is how and how long it will take. They are in the middle of a very big turnaround plan. For lack of a better description, they've torn out the guts of the old JCPenney and they're building a brand new model. So what do they do now? Do they stop? Do they do something new? And those are the questions we'll need to be asked when we look at is it fixable? A number of analysts think it is fixable. In fact, the previous CEO to Ullman, Alan Questrom, telling CNBC Scott Wapner that he actually believes it is fixable. So we'll see. It's definitely a split camp. I don't exactly know what's going to happen. This is late breaking news, and we're still asking a lot of questions ourselves. All right, more questions and answers at this hour. Courtney Reagan, thanks very much. Also Thank in the you. news tonight, a better than expected earnings from Alcoa, but shares slipped a bit in after hours trading. The aluminum giant is the first Dow component to turn in quarterly results, and its solid profits could be a positive kickoff for earnings season. Here are the numbers. Alcoa earned 11 cents a share. That was three cents more than estimates, but revenues came in below expectations, down 3 percent to $5.8 billion. Now, Alcoa also said it expects global demand for aluminum to rise by 7 percent this year and sales of aluminum products to the auto, aerospace and construction industries did very, very well. When I talked with Alcoa CEO Klaus Kleinfeld a short while ago, I asked him about the outlook for those sectors for the rest of this year. 
We're seeing that there's very strong demand in some of the end markets that we cater to. Uh, when we look at aerospace, we believe it's in the large commercial aircraft, it's probably more between 9 to 12 percent growth rate. You have to also keep in mind that there is an eight-year backlog of planes. So it's a very stable market and growing very, very nicely. You even see growth now in business jets and uh, and and uh, regional jets. So this is this is very good. Automotive. Automotive in the U.S., which is particularly important for us. It's continuing to grow very, very nicely. We're seeing, we're seeing that it's coming to, to, to levels of pre-crisis times. And at the same time, we also see that the average age of the car fleet in the U.S. is still higher than it used to be. So there's continuous be, to be pent-up demand. And what makes me particularly excited is that there's a stronger consumer drive for lightweight, and for, uh, for better uh, uh, gasoline efficiency. And that's driving very, very strongly the aluminum demand on top of it. And building on construction, a large market, very important for the U.S. economy, is coming back. Finally, it's coming back. And uh, I guess mm -hmm. now everybody sees this. Klaus, as you know, though, in the last couple of days, there have been new worries about the strength of the U.S. recovery. So from your perspective, is the economy slowing down? How is the U.S. economy really doing? U.S. economy, I think, is uh, not slowing down. It continues to grow. What you see, there is a counter force there coming in through sequestration. So uh, some of the public spending goes down, but at the same time, you see that the businesses are growing. I believe that that's a good thing to happen and a good structure mm -hmm. for the uh, economy in the U.S. So I continue to be optimistic. We're not seeing a high growth environment like the one that we will be seeing in China, but I don't think anybody can expect that Are for a mature economy like the US one. All right, so given your optimism, will you be hiring this year? Actually, the interesting thing is if you look at our global numbers, we are around 61,000 employees worldwide. And uh, there are some moves in there. And interestingly, that the, we see that the U.S. has been gaining on the employment side. And that's very much a reflection also what happens in our portfolio. The more we build out our value at business, the more you see aerospace as well as automotive growing. And you see there's a lot of action going on here. And then on top of it, I mean, with uh, the uh, very attractive lower lower uh, energy prices now that also uh, helps right. uh, particularly then on our upstream side. One thing that's not working in your favor are aluminum prices which are down sharply over the last couple of years. What has to happen for those prices to go up and is part of your strategy to cut back on aluminum production? Well, our strategy is very clearly focused to be independent of what we can control. So let's focus on the things that we can control. The things that we can control on our upstream business is to come down on the cost curve. To no matter where the market is going to be, we are going to be profitable. And you see that reflected in this quarter, actually. Metal prices are down, and you see a remarkable performance from our upstream business. Tell me about China. You mentioned it a moment ago. From the customers that you're dealing with there, are they ordering more? or less? People are ordering more. We see we, we project 11 percent demand growth on aluminum this year in China. On Wall Street today, stocks closed at the highs for the session as investors looked ahead to those results from Alcoa and to earnings of several other blue chips later this week, including J.P. Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo. Now, the aluminum giant was one of the biggest gainers in the Dow today, rising nearly 2 percent as of the 4 p.m. New York close. For a good part of the day, stocks traded in the red, still reeling from those disappointing jobs numbers on Friday. In the end, though, the Dow did close higher by 48 points. The Nasdaq was up about 18, and the S&P 500 gained nearly 10 points to 1563. As earnings season begins, the consensus forecast is, to put it mildly, tepid for U.S. corporate profit growth. But our next guest is a little more bullish than the crowd. He's Jonathan Golub, chief investment strategist at UBS. Jonathan, always great to see you. Hey, Tyler. You're a little more bullish, but it is a qualified bullishness, as I understand. Yeah, I mean, to say that you have 2.5% earnings growth expectations, which is our call for this quarter, is, is bullish, is really hard to make the case for. And if you look at how you even got there, it's buybacks and losses that were a year ago at the banks made their prior year look even worse. But uh, short of that, you're basically talking about zero growth this quarter. So if there is zero growth this quarter, what do you see down uh, for the rest of the year? 
Um, you know, our full year expectations, you have three and a half to four percent earnings growth for the whole year. That's roughly in line with what other strategists are thinking. Analysts are always a little bit too optimistic on the, you know, on the out quarters. So I expect their estimates to come in, you know, as the year progresses along. So if, if that's the level of earnings growth that you're looking forward to, uh, what's the level of stock market price growth that you're willing to bake into your forecast? Yeah, Tyler, you know, you and I have had this conversation. Why am I, you know, not optimistic right now about the market? You have a market that's up over 15 percent since mid-November, and yet you're looking at earnings growth in the low to mid single digits is a really big disconnect. So I think unless you get better better earnings that are being forecast right now, very hard for this rally to continue. So, so why are stocks up as much as they are? Is it all uh, the monetary stimulus that's uh, come in? Printing press is running. And, and also, I think that, you know, at the end of the year, we got over the fiscal cliff. We got over the debt ceiling issues. And, you know, the world, you know, continued to operate and people are feeling pretty good about that. But short of that and the money printing, I, there's really not a lot of great news in the econo you know, in, in the earnings uh, front. So are world. you looking for a sizable correction? If you say that the, that the stock rally can't really continue or go right. that much higher from here, are you looking for a, a treading water kind of scenario or a decline and then a return? What? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to know whether this is a, a fizzle or, or whether it's a pullback. But the more important thing is if you have three, four percent earnings growth. I just don't see how you could possibly get the market to continue the pace of the run that you've had so far. And, and if you look at what's running, it's the most defensive sectors. Defensive sectors. sectors. It's right, healthcare. Well, it's telecom. It's other things. It's like that. That. And matter of fact, the earnings expectation, why are those sectors outperforming? Because those are the ones that are expected to actually deliver earnings. The cyclical things, the, the industrial sector, the tech sector, the energy sector are expected to have year over year declines in earning. That's not really a good thing for the market. All right. So make me some money here. From this point forward through the end of the year, what right. sector do you think can outperform what you seem to be saying is going to be a relatively flattish market? Right. Okay. So we have to differentiate between this earnings season and stock price movement. But I like the consumer sectors. I think it's going to be a little bit of a rough earnings season because of this tax increase that we had. But I think the consumer holds up better than people think. Um, I also like health care, especially in the back half of the year. As we go into Obamacare, I think the stocks are going to rally. Jonathan Golub, thank you very much. Always great to be with you. Good to see you. Thanks for coming out. Turning now to market focus, we begin with General Electric and a $3 billion acquisition. GE is buying Lufkin Industries. This is the oil field pump maker. The purchase increases GE's presence in the energy market and is a key part of the company's focus on the shale fields of North Dakota and Texas. GE shares rose slightly to $23 a share, and Lufkin Industries surged more than 37 percent, up $24 to about $88 a share. Other oil field stocks moved higher in sympathy, including Weatherford, Dover, and Dresser Rand. Avon says it'll cut 400 jobs. That's about 1 percent of its global workforce. The cuts are part of the cosmetic firm's effort to slim down, which includes the closing of some operations in the Middle East, Africa, and Europe. Shares of Avon rose more than 1 percent to $20 and change. Johnson & Johnson was the biggest loser in the Dow today. The stock fell after a J.P. Morgan analyst downgraded shares of the healthcare giant to hold from buy, saying he expects the company to reduce its profit forecast. The stock has, however, run up 30 percent since last June, and it finished today at 81.11. Airline stocks saw some pretty hefty gains today, with the New York Stock Exchange's airline index rising more than 2 percent. Shares of Delta rose nearly 4 percent. JetBlue shares ended higher. Even United at, at Airlines, which was dead last in a recent government survey on quality and air, airline performance, saw shares rise nearly 3 percent today. And speaking of that survey, if you fly, you might think the words airline and quality don't often belong in the same sentence. But the Department of Transportation is out with its annual rankings of the 14 largest U.S. carriers for things like on-time performance, lost baggage, and customer complaints. And some of the results just might surprise you. Phil LeBeau has our report. If you've flown lately, you know the drill. Long lines, packed planes, and customer service that is often lacking. It's not nearly as much fun as it used to be. I think some of the bigger airlines are really starting to nickel and dime travelers. The latest report on airline quality confirms passengers are losing patience. Last year, complaints to the federal government jumped 20 percent and more customers were bumped from oversold flights. Two negatives overshadowing the fact airlines have done a slightly better job handling bags and arriving on time. We have asked the DOT, well, how many complaints do you think are out there that you never hear about? And they say that chances are there's at least 
uh, four to five times the number of complaints that they hear about. And last year they heard of just right at 11,400 complaints. Complaints by travelers soared in part because of airline mergers. As carriers have combined, it hasn't always been smooth. Also upsetting for travelers, a noticeable increase in passengers being bumped from oversold flights. As airlines have stripped out flights and shifted to smaller planes so their schedules are more profitable, it's left them fewer empty seats and less flexibility for rebooking bumped passengers. Airlines really have to figure out how to manage their business now with, these, uh, uh, with the smaller capacity that's in the marketplace. Uh, they do have a responsibility to us as the traveling public to get us where we are going uh, reasonably. So which airlines did the best job last year? Low-cost carriers Virgin America, JetBlue and AirTran led the list. Meanwhile, the five worst airlines include American and United, legacy carriers who also saw above average complaints. Unfortunately for thousands who are flying, the experience will not be improving anytime soon. Airlines are reluctant to add new flights or bigger planes, so the planes that we see in the sky will be packed, meaning going from point A to point B may not be much fun in the near future. For Nightly Business Report, Phil LeBeau, Mobile, Alabama. It's not fun to fly these days, but how do you feel about uh, your trip to Ireland later this week? You're going to be flying I'm on United I'm be dead flying last on, in the survey. I'm going to be going on United, so they've got four days to get it together. <laughs> uh, you know, I think one of the things that Phil said to me offline earlier was that one of the things that cropped up with, with United was that last year when they integrated their computer systems between them and Continental, there were major snafus, and that got an awful lot of people angry. Let's hope they work it out. you got, you got four days, United. Come on now. All right, coming up, tax changes are coming, and they could impact your nest egg. We have some new retirement strategies to consider for this year and beyond. But first, a look at how international markets fared today. If it's Monday, it must be Belgium. Newly installed Treasury Secretary Jack Lew is on his first trip to Europe, meeting today with the President of the European Union in Brussels and later with the head of the European Central Bank in Frankfurt, Germany. Lew says that struggling European countries should try to ease up on austerity measures and adopt instead more growth-friendly economic policies. The White House is preparing to release its fiscal year 2014 budget proposal in just a few days, with thousands of copies coming off the printing press today. President Obama's proposal comes after the Democratic-controlled Senate already passed one budget, and the Republican-controlled House passed a different version. Last week, the president offered to consider reductions in entitlement programs like Social Security and Medicare in exchange for new tax revenues as part of a long-term budget deal. The Senate got back to work today after a two-week recess, and it confirmed former federal prosecutor Mary Jo White as Wall Street's top cop. She'll chair the Securities and Exchange Commission. White received a lot of bipartisan support in the Senate thanks to her years as the U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York, where she went after insider traders, mobsters, and terrorists. Well, one week from today, federal taxes are due, so chances are you've already filed this year's forms. But today, we kick off a week-long series of tax tips to consider ahead of next year's filings. Some big changes in tax laws going into effect in 2013 might force many top earners to consider making significant changes right now to their retirement savings accounts. Sharon Epperson explains. Attorney Doug Bramley usually gets a tax refund each spring. But he's not counting on one this year or in the future. That's no longer going to happen. You know, as my tax burden increases, I'm paying more and more in taxes. I'm not getting tax refunds. And we're having to plan financially for that. Top earners like Bramley will take a big tax hit this year on earned and investment income. For couples with incomes over $450,000, $400,000 if you're single, Increases in federal income tax and a Medicare surtax will result in a total tax hit of nearly 42 percent on earned income in 2013, a more than 5 percent increase over last year. 
Plus, taxes on dividends and long-term capital gains have surged almost 9 percent compared to last year to nearly 24 percent for top earners. And the tax on interest income in 2013 is a whopping 43 percent. Facing a potential tax hit like this is forcing households like Bramley's to make some changes. We have already done as a family a lot of planning in anticipation of the fact that my income is going to be a little bit lower next year because of these, these big tax bites. Big changes for portfolio planning may lie ahead too. Financial advisors say new tax hikes increase the need for diversification and new strategies when investing for your financial future. Maybe buying some stocks for growth purposes that aren't paying dividends that maybe give you the same result in the end but have a little less tax implication. So that's, that's one. Two, make sure that after you look at your non-qualified money, you go to your tax deductible money, your 401ks, your 403bs, your IRAs, and make sure that you're absolutely maximizing those opportunities. Contributing the maximum amount to a 401k, up to $17,500 this year or $23,000 if you're 50 or older, will reduce your taxable income. Convert a regular IRA to a Roth IRA, you'll be taxed on the money you convert, but you can generally take the money out tax-free after age 59 and a half. And keep a taxable account in the mix, although putting more dollars there may be less attractive now. With the tax increase coming up, we're going to be putting more and more money into my Roth IRA and my traditional IRA. For many, a varied investment strategy for an uncertain tax landscape is an imperative. We're going to get back to really managing investments as to what the tax liability might be. And those folks who manage it the best will get to the finish line first. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Sharon Epperson. Our series on tax tips will continue tomorrow with new ways to save for your retirement, including Roth 401ks. And if you've got questions for Sharon on that topic, why don't you send them to us at uh, nbrmail at cnbc.com. And still ahead on the program, a Powerball fever hits the Golden State. Is it the answer to California's financial problems? But first, let's take a look at how commodities, treasuries, and currencies did today. Many California residents are hoping to hit the jackpot, so they'll be set for retirement. Starting today, Powerball lottery tickets went on sale in California. It's the 43rd state to join the nationwide game. Julia Borston tells us how, how much officials think Californians will spend for a shot to strike it rich and what all that revenue might mean to the Golden State. Thank you. Good luck. California is the 43rd state to jump on the Powerball bandwagon. Tickets are two bucks instead of one, which means bigger jackpots than the state's current games, at least 60 million. But the chances of winning the top prize, less than one in 175 million. But that isn't stopping the stream of wannabe winners we've seen at the farmer's market newsstand. There's one, right? <laughs> I could be the one. I figured I would take my chances today. It's only a few dollars and I can I can make millions. The only sure winner will be the state of California. The Multi-State Lottery Association projects a net increase of $100 million in sales. 40% of that revenue will go to California schools, so they'll see a roughly $40 million bump. That's a drop in the bucket considering that the state spends $68 billion annually on education. But there are other winners. The 21,500 California retailers selling these tickets see a huge boost in traffic from people coming in to try their chance at Powerball and for promotions like this. All of our shopper studies show that lottery players go in more frequently to the convenience stores and they buy more goods. So I think there's a tremendous benefit for the retailers. They see more traffic and they get improved sales. California Lottery Director O'Neill projecting the state will boost nationwide Powerball sales by as much as 25 percent, which could lead to a billion dollar jackpot in the next few years. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston.
Former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice took some swings at Augusta. She was on the course during a practice session with Phil Mickelson, a three-time Masters champ. She also put on the private club, club's traditional green jacket as she talked with some fellow members. Last August, Rice became one of the first two female members at Augusta National. The Masters tournament gets underway later this week. And finally, the world is mourning tonight the passing of Britain's Iron Lady. Former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher passed away today. She was 87. She governed for 11 years, starting in 1979. She was a strong proponent of free markets. She revitalized the British economy and radically changed the role of government. She developed a close relationship with U.S. President Ronald Reagan during the Cold War and backed President George Bush during the 1991 Gulf War. And today, President Obama said America has lost a true friend. You know, though, Tyler, still, there are a lot of questions about her legacy. She's being criticized for a lot of her uh, decisions that she made. History will... Many controversial moves during her time, but when asked uh, why she was named the Iron Lady, the, she said the Soviets gave her that name. She said they were right. And that'll do it for tonight's Nightly Business Report. I'm Tyler Matheson. Thanks for watching. I'm Susie Garib. Have a great evening, everyone. We'll see all of you right back here tomorrow. Nightly Business Report has been brought to you by... TheStreet.com, interactive financial multimedia tools for an ever-changing financial world. Our dividend stock advisor guides and helps generate income during a period of low interest rates. Real money helps you think through ideas for investing and trading stocks. Action Alerts Plus is a charitable trust portfolio that provides trade-by-trade -trade strategies. Online, mobile, social media. We are TheStreet.com. with a nightly business report news brief. Alcoa kicked off earnings season with a larger than expected profit last quarter. The aluminum giant also said demand this year is strong, especially from aircraft makers. Those results could set the tone for trading in the markets tomorrow. Ahead of that, the Dow rose 48 points, the Nasdaq added 18, and the S&P 500 up nearly 10 points. General Electric is paying $3 billion in cash for oil field equipment maker Lufkin Industries. A new government survey out today, ranking of the nation's biggest airlines for things like on-time arrivals, lost luggage, and overbooked flights. Virgin America was the best overall, then JetBlue, United was the worst. And California became the 43rd state to join the Powerball lottery game. Be sure to tune into Nightly Business Report right here on your public television station.